so hello everyone. My name is Vasiliki. I'm the founder and creative director of Kimatan. We are a creative studio based in Minneapolis um, that co-creates products and experiences with small businesses, nonprofits, and organizations. Really, we're a platform um, that would like to spread awareness and showcase diverse voices and efforts here in the Twin Cities. Um, we were started about a year ago now um, out of a passion for brick and mortar and small businesses. Um, and I'm really excited today to have the honor to be joined by four local theater leaders um, at a time when I think for a lot of us, um, at least for myself, I've really truly understood and appreciated the importance of theater stages um, and the power that those spaces have um, for learning, for understanding, and um, really as a space to bring people together. Um, and so I'm really excited to better understand today and um, hear from people that are in that space on um, their perspectives and um, their thoughts on theater moving forward. And hopefully we can all be welcomed back to the stage soon. So today we have Mina from Pangea World Theater. Um, I will try to pronounce your last name. But I think it's a little bit like mine where it's long and intimidating. Natarajan. That's right. That's good. Okay. Amazing. Um, so she's from Pangea World Theater. We have Nathan Keepers um, from The Moving Company. Ansa Ankea from Park Square Theater and Robin Gillette from The Jungle Theater. So I'm gonna start off and um, really leave it with the four of you to introduce yourselves. Um, tell us a little bit about why, you know, why are you involved in theater and um, how, what do you do and what does your organization um, consist of? So my name is um, Mina Natarajan, I'll start. <laughs> thank you, thank you. And thank you so much for uh, having me. I'm really honored uh, that you would ask me. Um, also just want to acknowledge that uh, I, where we work on the traditional and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people and also really honored and privileged to work with First Nations, live and work uh, with First Nations in the Twin Cities. Um, and uh, Pangea began, this is our 25th year, and so we've unfortunately spent our entire 25th year in COVID. Uh, we had all kinds of grand plans to do um, many, many things this year, uh, you know, unroll uh, and, and uh, all kinds of things on stage, restate some of our performances, and we couldn't do that. Um, but uh, so Pangea really began uh, in 1995. Um, with the intention of bringing together people from different backgrounds, ethnicities, across class, across race, uh, together to create work together. So we really uh, started and, uh, with equity and justice uh, being the center of how we do our work. Um, so uh, that is it's something that happened. Our, my co-artistic director, Deepankar Mukherjee, uh, was working at the Guthrie Theater at that time. And then he came out of the Guthrie because he really wanted to create a space that was very, very uh, diverse. I mean, I really don't like using the words inclusive and diverse anymore because they don't mean anything. And uh, but really, equity and justice is something that I can uh, hold. And and so the word pan um, is universal. Gaia is the Greek goddess of the earth, and of course, Pangea is Greek. You know that uh, Pangea is that supercontinent that existed when the whole world was one landmass. So we really take that uh, 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 mission, that mission of ours, very seriously, and work to bring people across difference uh, and not in a you are the world, we are the world kind of way, but really to understand each other across that uh, uh, difference and to, uh, and for us, one of the things that we say at Pangea is, you know, only the work is at the center, like we, you know, in this, in this country, we have, all of us have a relationship with whiteness. So, you know, it's like every refugee who comes here, everyone, it's like this black and white paradigm. And so one of the uh, one of the metaphors that we use is that let's all be in the circle and let the work be at the center of that circle. And so how do we? And so then then we are actually then negotiate then then how do we negotiate with each other and build solidarity? Is one of our key, key uh, P, uh, is uh, is one of our key kind of missions and uh, the way we do our work. Um, so those things are really really important in how we do our work. Our aesthetics come from many different places. 
and it depends on the piece of work that we are give, doing at any given time. And I can, I'll talk a little bit more about how we do our work uh, as we go along, but that's really a little bit in a nutshell of what uh, Penja is. And I myself am from India. I'm an immigrant um, and uh, get, come from uh, a background of street theater as well in India and, and really privileged to be part of this amazing community in the Twin Cities. Thank you so much, Mina. And I hope everything is well for you and for your family in India right now. Ah, uh, it is really worrying. My, um, you know, one of my family members, one of my husband's family members has uh, COVID. So we're kind of monitoring that situation. Um, and uh, a couple of other family members on my own, my own uh, have gone and tested for it. So, it, it, and, and there are no hospital beds, as you know, there are no hospital beds, people are dying. Uh, it's really, uh, it's, ve it's a very, very difficult situation. Uh, so uh, we feel like we're being hit by uh, like a ton of bricks at this moment. Um, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, and it's hard to know what to do, uh, but I think that we just have to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And that's all we can do at any given time. Just breathe one step at a time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, wishing them the best and theater is such an outlet for, you know, energy like that and what we can do. So thanks for joining today. Um, Robin, would you like to go next? I am Robin Gillette. I'm the managing director of the Jungle Theater. We were founded in 1991, so just a hair before Pangea. We are located right at the intersection of Lake and Lindale, Minneapolis. And our mission is to create courageous, resonant theater that challenges, entertains, and sparks expansive conversation. So for us, it's kind of all about the stories and trying to find ways to tell stories on our stage that resonate with the people in the audience who bring their own stories to the room. And that's kind of, I don't know, that's, that's enough. I'll, <laughs> I'll pass. Short and sweet. Yeah. Nathan? Yeah, uh, my name is Nathan Keepers. I am the producing co-artistic director of The Moving Company in Minneapolis, which we don't have a space. We move around the town um, and we were, I guess we were founded in 2009, but we come from, uh, it's myself, Stephen Epp and Dominique Sarand, and we come from uh, Theater de la Jeanne Lune, which was founded back in uh, the late seventies and closed in 2008. So after that closing, we formed a little bit out of the ashes of that and have been continuing to make work in that tradition, which sort of lives in uh, European street theater, clown, circus, uh, a, a, deep, a deep physicality to the work that's sort of at the core of what we do. Um, and especially with the moving company, it's creation. We all are uh, trained in a form uh, pedagogy by Jacques Lecoq, a French teacher. And um, a big part of that is training your body and your imagination to create your own work. So many people mm -hmm. come out of there, start their own companies. Um, so the deep theatricality is at the core of what we do and it's sort of the, uh, the power of uh, theater taking us to a different place when we think about the world that we're in. We take the mundane and try to make it really poetic, try to take the poetic, the humanity and make it bigger than maybe what we are used to. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you, Nathan. And last but not least, Ansa. Hello, hello, one and all. Uh, my name is Ansa Achea. Uh, he, him, his are my pronouns. I'm currently in St. Paul, the land of the Anishinaabe, Wapikute people, past and present, trying to honor the land uh, that I'm literally on and that I live on and I do all my business from. So just uh, grateful to be here on, on this virtual space. Um, yeah, I'm representing Park Square today, but I'm also a board member with YAI, which is a, a youth uh, arts initiative uh, theater, also in St. Paul. But uh, my journey really with Park Square has been as an artistic associate in Park Square, I think it was founded in 1975, uh, and it tried to uphold all the multiplicity of voices in the community, and it's gone through quite a few changes lately. So the artistic associate position was created to really bring in artists to inform the structure and also the programming and everything else that has happened in the past and uh, really to be present to what the future is going to be. 
that's probably the best way I can kind of encapsulate the work that I'm currently doing. Uh, but in my other life, I also work as a facilitator with a world coach, and I'm also working um, as an independent contractor, as an artist, right, as a theater maker. So prior to the pandemic, I was in Kansas City uh, working on a brand new play by Stacey Rose called Legacy Land, really powerful piece of theater uh, in Kansas City. Uh, and we had literally what we call now the clopening, right? You have the opening and the closing all in one night. So I uh, got in my car <laughs> and drove back home to the Twin Cities and, and then everything else uh, emanated from there. Just um, a lot of what's probably gonna be talked about today, but really the reality of the pandemic, uh, what unemployment has looked like, what creating under those stresses and um, really those uh, newfound muscles, really, let's call it that. And then also just the residual of, of all that. What do we want to bring forth? What do we want to leave behind? Uh, how do we challenge some existing structures? And how can we make theater better and healthier and, and also more profitable, right? And what does that mean? So I'm hopeful that we're going to answer all of those things today, which is why you called us, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, no, but uh, it's such an honor to be part of this group. And thank you again for reaching out. But uh, yeah, Ansa Treya, he, him, his, Parksworth Theater Artistic Associate today and just theater makers. So a pleasure to be here. Great, thanks so much, Anta. And I think with that, we should we should dive in and we should um, start with some of those questions that you brought up, Anta. And um, I would love your thoughts on, on, on the topics and kind of what you're seeing in the space and um, those muscles, like you said, that are being kind of retrained and repurposed. And um, yeah, I'll leave it with you um to share any thoughts and experiences yeah i guess i mean i don't mind i kind of opened opened up with that but uh you know i think one of the things that's happening right now we're all being whether we want to admit it or not really forced to see what our community relationships are how strong are they you know in the light of the of the murder of george floyd and the verdict uh, that was an added layer of reality that we have to contend with right so what does theater really have to do with all the things that we're dealing with. And I think, you know, whether we are um, part of the community <laughs> or we're just, we think we're just theater patrons and purchase a ticket and go into those spaces, we understand we have a responsibility to carry these stories so that we can really affirm our humanity. But specifically, it really means that we are dismantling white supremacy. At least that's the work that I'm involved in, right? So representation matters. Uh, spaces in which we're really thinking about being whole and present and being able to create uh, safely and bravely without having the repercussions or the admonition, right, and, and operating from a place of fear. Um, those are things that we might all think we understand, but once we get to the individual, it really means we have to have intentional conversations about what that is, right? Uh, I opened up and I think, you know, uh, Mina also talked about the land that we're literally operating on. Uh, it informs the history in which these theaters, uh, the practices that they have, right? So I think all of us can speak for our theaters in terms of our mission statements and our structures and organizations, but it's really about how do we carry that out? You know, what does that day-to-day -day labor look like? What does our board structures look like? What do our, what does our programming say about the moment that we're currently living in? And that's really what I'm, I'm inviting into my artistic, you know, body and spirit right now is what does it mean for me to be, um, how I identify as a black person in uh, the Twin Cities making theater, right? So that's more of a question, but that's kind of what I contend with right now. Yeah, and going off of that, Robin, um, I'd like to ask you, Jungle Theater is in a really special place in Minneapolis and really at the heart of kind of what we've seen um, kind of unfold in the, in the last couple of months. and in the year since um, George Floyd was murdered. And, you know, just a, a couple of weeks ago, there was National Guard right outside of the Jungle Theater. How, um, and I know that because of, um, it's Greek to me, which is right next door. Uh, <laughs> um, but how how is the programming at Jungle Theater and how are you reimagining the, the way that you use your space um, for to kind of um, acknowledge that perhaps or, um, take that and integrate it into um, what you offer. And a combination of two influences, as everyone else on the panel is uh, painfully aware. We've all had to stop doing regular plays, 
in regular venues with regular audiences like we're quite like like we all know how to do so um everyone has been trying to just figure out in the absence of being able to use our favorite tool what other tools do we have to use so we've been exploring ways to um our so our building is right on the corner of lake and lindale next to street to me uh, kitty corner to the building that nina is in and we've got these beautiful storefront windows. So we've been doing theatrical displays. We've been hiring theater designers to create work for the windows that then allows people to walk by in COVID safe ways to see the work. And we did um, a projection. We hired projection designers to put a projection on the outside of our building. Again, so it's like you guys can't come in right now, but we still have this facility and a place where you can gather we're, we're going to let some designers use the wall to tell a story. And so we started with trying to figure that out just because of COVID. And then as the, the fallout from the George Floyd murders and all of the, and the uprising in that has heightened our awareness that we've always said we were a community-based organization. And community, much in the way that Nina said that the words diversity and inclusion have become such murky, like it, 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 they mean everything and nothing now. Mm -hmm. uh, the word community can also mean everything and nothing. And so we have been trying to be really intentional about, okay, what does it mean to us to be embedded in the community? And for us, it has meant reaching out to community organizations. We've, our windows are currently full now. They're absolutely adorable with a art exhibit from students, I think the range is kindergarten to fifth grade from, from the Whittier International School, which is a couple blocks behind us. And just to kind of make, make provide, if we're not able to put arts actors on the stage, what other art in the community are we able to put in our windows? And then this summer, we are partnering with the Loon Lake Business Association to co-produce the Loon Lake Street Arts Festival. It's a beautiful, neighborhood if any of you have been in there you've driven around or walked around so much street art beautiful murals and beautiful graffiti art and so there's a festival every year to highlight that we're going to add a mural to our building we're going to have activities we're going to put a stage in the backyard we've invited Fangia and other neighborhood arts organizations to be on the stage mm. so just trying to find a way to take the resources we have we have a building we have a stage, we have trained production people, we've got marketing talent. How can we use that to actively support everyone in the neighborhood, not just our own stuff? So I would say that that's kind of the synopsis of how we're evolving. Yeah, that's amazing, Rob. I can't wait for the, for the festival. Um, Nina and Nathan, you both mentioned street theater and like how that's something that you have performed in and um, you have experience in, and that is in a way is another stage. Um, talk a little bit, if you would like, talk a little bit about um, kind of how that's influenced your work and um, perhaps how that redefines the stage for you in these times or how theater can be um, disseminated. You start. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like one of the things, you know, for me, uh, even when, when you're in a stage, uh, to depart from proscenium is actually really important. And street theater actually teaches you how to be in the round. It teaches you how to like really have audience everywhere. And so I think we actually, even in our performances for the last so many years, we've been dispelling that whole notion of what that means to have somebody sitting in front, some, you know, like, like church, like having audiences in front, how do we involve and um, uh, include the audience in our work. Um, and, and uh, you know, Benjia does uh, productions. We do presentations. We present people from across the country. Uh, we've had one of the longest indigenous voices for the last, uh, you know, uh, 20 years that we've been doing. Um, and also, um, we, have, we do community-based work. And a lot of our community, we've, we've been in the street and doing work from for the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years. Um, our, uh, and, um, we have uh, we have a, our community-based program works on it's very site-specific. 
we work on Lake Street. We kind of like try to stick to Lake Street when we work because we believe in working in our own neighborhood. And so we work the length and breadth of Lake Street. In fact, the mural on 12th and uh, Lake is Pangea's on the Plaza uh, Centenario. Um, and that is a Pangea mural that was created in 20, I don't know, 16 or four, uh, 2015 sometime. Um, and uh, uh, and also, so we so we've been doing visual arts work. We've been doing site specific work uh, through our, uh, what we call our Lake Street Arts Program. And so we've been really really active. When COVID happened last year, you know, we had to all go home. And like um, you, uh, you all said, like the other people on the panel said, uh, you <laughs> we there was no where to go. There was no so our uh, show stopped halfway across. Like literally, it was a really amazing piece uh, called Sueño, and it just kind of came to an end. Uh, an abrupt end, and so it just felt so. Um, and so what? And and so we we retreated at that time. We said we we really feel like we want to take a pause here because we don't know what we want to do, and we want to see what how can we uh, be relevant to this time and space that we're in, which has always been kind of our um, the way that we work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so and then when George Floyd got murdered, we, it was like another line in the sand, right? And so. Really, uh, like, so so as, as soon as that happened, we actually then commissioned all of our staff members, who are all artists, to create work in response to that. And every staff member created amazing, amazing pieces of work. And then through our Lake Street Arts Program, uh, we also have a project called Lake Street Story Circles, which we activated during that time. So we had an additional about 10 artists doing story circles and creating performances out of that story circles. And many, all of those performances were outdoors. So we really supported the work of people outside, either in our backyard or in Powderhorn Park or in other sp or spaces in Lake Street. Uh, there was a project that was like literally like one of our artists sat at the corners of Lake Street and Bloomington and other streets and asked for what people's wishes for Lake Street were. And then out of that piece, this artist named Sandy Agustin, who's an amazing um, uh, artist in the Twin Cities, she came up with these giant masks that had wishes written all over them mm -hmm. about you know what what they wished for lake street so we came we had like we literally commissioned almost 20 25 artists since that time and uh, to create work and so re really so this is the kind of the way we do our work our lake street arts work is especially activated right now and um you know right now we're working in the corner of 27th and lake where all the uh, where the uprising happened and where many of the restaurants were burnt and uh, so we're planning, to, we're doing most, lots of site specific work right there right now. And our next piece of work is uh, Sharon Day's piece. I don't know if any of you know Sharon Day. She is the executive director of the Indigenous Peoples Task Force. Mm -hmm. She's a board member at Pangea. She's a close personal friend. We've known her for the last 25 years. And she's been in many of our pieces. We've worked with her uh, youth, Indigenous youth as well. And so uh, Sharon is doing a, uh, written a piece about her Missouri River water walk. And so she's doing that piece as Hidden Falls, like in two weeks time. And we're doing, making it an outdoor piece with lots and lots of music and ceremony and ritual about, and it's close to the Mississippi River. And uh, so it's so it's going to be recreating that walk and all the things mm -hmm. that like a meditative kind of, uh, you know, walk, uh, 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 story of that walk uh, and the things that happened to her in the 2017 walk, they did it for 53 days. And so all kinds of things happen from encounters with police to, uh, you know, uh, to uh, to to just ceremony and uh, uh, this relationship between these six women who participated in that walk for the 53 days, and so that's a piece that's happening uh, in Hidden Falls in on the 22nd, 23rd, around that time, May, um, in May, and so that's a piece that we're doing outside as a result of this, and that's a piece that we had rehearsed inside our studio, and now it's going to be outside. It feels fitting that that piece would be outside. Mm -hmm in the space. So we have a, lots of pieces coming up that are going to be outside and lots of, uh, 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 you know, artistic work, like theater works, but also we're doing uh, something called poetry as placeholders as part of our Lake Street Arts program, where we're doing poetry um, outside the windows of many uh, of the restaurants and places on Lake Street. So I'm going to stop there because we really literally have tons of work coming up that's out in the street uh, that we're doing site specifically and we don't know when we're going to go back inside. It is very difficult for us as theater artists. We hate rehearsing on Zoom. I feel like <laughs> rehearsal on Zoom is the most <laughs> dead thing that you can ever do. But really, our work right now is influenced uh, by the by what happened, by the murder of George Floyd, by the things that are happening right now, by the anti-Asian violence that's happening right now. I mean, how, how can you be in this current world and not be relevant? 
to the time and space that you're in and be part of conversations and, and figure out how to create systems change. Um, I've, I really listened to everything that Ansa said and it really spoke to me. And, and really that's the kind of place that we're in as well. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, yeah, for the moving company, it works in a different way. I, I may be misled by street theater. We haven't been on the street doing street theater in years. I don't remember the last time we did that. But I would say the, the what we talk about a lot is the, the root forms of storytelling in theater that we pull from. So going back to uh, Commedia dell'arte in Italy and even uh, No and Butto in Japan and things that are really rooted in, in again, in this physicality of the actor um, and in the, the creative mind of the actor. Um, say, uh, to repeat again, the shutdown is, is something that I, I think we're still kind of processing with as an organization, as an artist, to have what you've been doing, you know, pretty consistently for however long, suddenly whipped out that to adjust and to understand what the value of it is for yourself and for your organization, what the value of it is for other people and just how to like work through that is difficult on its own. And then when you can't do the thing that you usually do to process through that, mm -hmm. it starts to get really murky. That's how I've been than, than working through it at least. It's a, it's a harder thing to process through. So for us, same, we are sort of like, I mean, maybe to a detriment, we can't do Zoom. It's really like, it's not, it, we don't do it. So in, in some ways we've, we've really shut, we've really kind of gone underground in some ways. We did a project in the fall um, where we adapted uh, a show that we made called Liberty Falls a few years ago, which was in response to um, well, it was in response to the Republicans and the conventions and, and where Trump was starting to emerge, that which we at the time thought was just pure stupidity. So we made a show about the stupidest people we possibly could that was very same kind of grounded in this like commedia, this clown world. Um, and it was great fun to like sort of take the piss out of all that. And then we brought it back when he got elected because we were like, oh my gosh. So we actually took, brought it back in the fall and we adapted it to be in a web series that sort of followed this group, this small town, it's a small town in Wisconsin, um, and sort of their a direct link to each step that we were in up to the election, meaning like lockdown in March, summer when things were easing up, and then into the election and sort of what this kind of conservative town of white Wisconsin people and and the 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 people of color who are sort of assimilated into that into that world and don't understand and that the white people don't understand. Just we made a real satire of all that. It was a really deep satire. So that was helpful to get through. Um, but as we look forward, we really don't know and and we're having to be Frank, like we, we are a artist led organization by three white men you know, of cis white men. And so the, the reckoning that we have to do and sort of undo our own, what our mission, if you can call it that, or our, our philosophy around the work we've really developed amongst ourselves. And so the work now to open that up and, and bring new voices into that is starting to happen and has been happening. But it's, um, we're, we're, yeah, we're working on how we, how we do that more. And the best way to do that is to do the thing that we do. It's hard to just talk about amongst a Zoom meeting or, so we're really still trying to develop when we come back, how that works. And so, one step is is uh, the show that we're thinking about making the theme major theme is so where were we mm. and that's not a, a a thing to that's not a theme to say well so where were we let's start up where we left off it's mm. so where were we and how do we do it now and so you kind you have this group of people coming into a space and really it's saying like how do we make theater now but how how do we do this together now. And so to, to really go back and excavate 
sort of like archaeologically going back in time saying like where did we how did we start how did we get to these places how did we create these systems and all this stuff um and how do we undo it and how do we think differently and new as we go forward that's really powerful nathan um because it's only once you understand history that you can kind of prepare for or adapt um in the future uh Ansa, I, i'd love to get your thoughts so what are some of the barriers that on on that kind of moving forward now um what are some of the barriers and and ways that we can be creating a more equitable system through the arts? It's a great question. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna answer it kind of circuitously by saying, you know, one of the things that has happened also at Park Square is that uh, they are aligning with uh, other organization, Stepping Stone Theater that's in St. Paul also. And so what you're seeing is, I'm gonna use Park Square for as an example is, uh, it's a moment in time for us to stop and be really intentional to the point of what Nathan was talking about, right? Not just, okay, we're done with COVID, let's just pick up where we left off, but where are we right now? And what voices do we need to really pay attention to that we haven't been because for whatever reasons? And let me be really clear, we all have power and privilege in this space, right? The problem has been that it's only been one voice with the power that has been dominating everybody else's kind of like perspective, access, resources. And so when we're talking about opening it up, it is really being intentional. We're not saying just make it a blanket kind of like everyone come in, let's do what we do really well because the reality of circumstances, uh, again, going to Park Square and um, Stepping Stone, uh, what we're recreating and reimagining in that space is, okay, now we have education. How do we involve schools in that Park Square space? How, and or programming, or even really being intentional about stepping stones and the kind of stories we tell, right? And still being very cognizant that there are other arts organizations that do things very well, right? So what lane do we occupy and how do we actually serve our community from our space? Uh, the other conversation that is really happening intentionally is resources, right? Because we're in St. Paul and where Park Square is located, what does access look like? How much, how much is it gonna cost you for you to come to see a show? Right. And what does that mean for a person who might have a family or single? All those questions uh, that intersect with gender, with race, with privilege and power. So those are the kind of conversations that we're having intentionally. And I think before we were all, you know, myself included, was like next gig. I just I'm just trying to get to the next show. Right. The show must go on. I know my leg is falling off and I'm just going to continue. And it, quite frankly, the pandemic forced us to stop and be like, OK, there's got to be a different way. So things like really being intentional about reading, we see white American theater, right? What are the demands that they're asking? Where are the spaces for equity to happen? And by equity, I don't just mean, you know, we have two white people, two black people, two Asian, that's not what I'm talking about. It's really having these intentional conversations around what are we creating together here, right? And uh, not just the intention, but also um, the, the effect, right, of that, because um, we, we are all responsible, but at the same time, we want to be cognizant. And the only way we can do that is by engaging. So I don't want to dominate the conversation, but I, I think there is also this realignment of organizations. What does that mean? How do we use our, our, our funds? What does education look like? What does institutional um, uh, privilege and power look like in a community that is, quite frankly, in need of assistance, right? So I think that's my way of answering that part of it for Park Square and Stepping Stone. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious to hear what other folks have to say. Yeah, I mean, I'll, that's exactly in, in you know, we're, we language is such an important thing right now and how we all use the language is, that's exactly how we've been trying to think about it for the moving company, which is the, the, the what, what we have built over the years is unique, but maybe the better word is maybe personal and so like, as we go forward as artists, art making is a personal thing, whether you're doing it with a group of people or you're doing it by yourself, it's a very personal place to be in. It's a very vulnerable place to be in. And now we're in a world that's deeply vulnerable, more, maybe it's always been vulnerable, but the vulnerability is really exposed in a great way. And so how do we, what we've been talking about is that exact, our expertise and what we do in our little corner gives us power but how can we uh, make it that it's not the power of 
us, me, Nathan, or our, my colleagues, but the power of the art of making theater that has the power to, and that's for everybody. And how can we uh, uh, flatten that or tip that? I don't know quite what the right word is, but make that more uh, available. Just the act, the act of creation is what has the power and getting that for everybody to do. I just want to add one more point. Sorry, Mina, I saw you going. I'm going to be really brief. You know, the other reality of the fact of the matter is that you have folks who have studied and dedicated their lives to this art form, you know, and that's not to be disparaging to doctors or plumbers, but the reality of the circumstances, I don't know another art form or in job where if you stopped right now, you cannot do that thing. And that's where we are, right? And so we've had to reinvent literally ourselves. And I'm sure we all have narratives and uh, relationships of, with people who have told you Uber, well, like they've done things that they've had to do just to make ends meet. And so what we're also recognizing is this, there is a very big gap in terms of how do you sustain artists in, in our community? What does that look like, right? I, once upon a time in this country, I believe there was, there was intentional art making, meaning that it was subsidized by the government, right? Uh, and now it looks very much like philanthropy. It looks very much like writing grants. And so what does that mean as far as sustaining theater in this country? You know, and I think it's also interesting as we're all, you know, we all occupy a lane in terms of the community, but we're all being affected by the same thing. Like I have had the pleasure of seeing, you know, Nathan work and Robin in various capacities and Mina's work I'm very aware of. But what that means right now in this moment, none of us are doing what we're actually supposed to be doing. So it's very interesting for me that I have to also admit my like hesitancy. Do I want to go back? What's going to happen? How am I gonna feed my family? I mean, these are like base rudimentary questions I have to answer. And, and if it looks like um, I can't do it, then I'm guaranteeing you that it's very hard for, for me to inspire other folks to come and join me. So they're, they're, we're very present in the need right now. Right, so I just want to say that. Sorry, Mina. No, I mean, I feel like you just, you really hit, uh, uh, you said something really important right now. And for me, I feel like for a lot of people of color, uh, that has been the reality, not just now. It has been the reality for a very long time. And, uh, you know, people, uh, most uh, African-Americans and, and in, in fact, indigenous artists that I know uh, do mo mostly outreach, did mostly outreach gigs and most of the theaters in this community to just stay alive and have a, have a sustainable life. You know, I'm glad that now people are in main stage, what's called a main stage. Uh, but I feel like for, for this has been the reality for many of our friends. And in fact, uh, some of our friends refuse to compromise. Some of the elders of our community, especially African-American community that we've, we've been very close to who are our mentors, refuse to compromise. They said, well, if we, we, uh, we're not interested in doing the roles that other people are interested in us doing. We're just going to go our own. And we also saw them die in a way that was not, that was really, um, uh, uh, and this is before the pandemic, right? So without, uh, uh, without a, and, and, and some of these are national treasures of people who have, have uh, passed on in this way. So I am really clear that this is not a new conversation and we really don't wanna go back to whatever normal is and we need to move forward. And, and being involved in conversations across the country as well, I'm, I'm deeply involved in conversations to create a national coalition for theaters of color. And you know, as you know, we are part of something called the Twin Cities Theaters of Color Coalition that are uh, five theaters in the Twin Cities, um, Pinambra, Mo, Teatro del Pueblo, New Native Theater and Pangea that are involved in conversations around equity and justice and, and having conversations with philanthropy, around philanthropy in this conversation, because that is so important in how, how philanthropy works. So we've never, and, and most theaters of color have never had the resources. I've also been in conversations across the country for the last 10 years uh, in theater companies where I've seen theater companies die. Like, you know, the theater and art organizations led by people of color, the uh, founders have burnt out and the companies have gone on to, uh, to not exist anymore. So really this is the case for um, uh, many, many theaters of color and for artists of color in this country already before the pandemic. So I can only imagine, and my heart go that's one of the reasons why we decided to commission works when we were able to uh, for this last year. And so I, I honestly feel like I'm not interested in going back to any kind of normal. 
Um, and uh, I, I'm interested in seeing artists of color thrive. And also, I don't know if you uh, uh, know this, but really there is not a single theater of color that's founded by a person of color that owns their own space in the Twin Cities either. We, uh, we've been itinerant for a very long time. I think Pillsbury House was started by Ralph Remington and that's, that, that's a space in the Twin Cities, but it's also much more than a space, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and they do amazing work. I love, I mean, they're sis like sister or whatever, they're sibling theater in the Twin Cities. And so I feel uh, personally, so, so that's something that we all have to look at. And this is not for people of color to look at, it's for everyone to look at. Like, look at this, the historic city, what's happened, how resources have been distributed, why have systems in this? I, and, you know, I'm, people keep talking about systems change, but it's really simple to change systems, really resource the people that need to be resourced in this community right now, you know? And so, um, uh, and so I'm really interested in how we can right the wrongs that like, how can we uh, uh, like look at the inequities that have been perpetuated? We have to all look at our histories in order to do that. And, um, and also as, um, so, so I, I, you know, and right now we're deeply involved in the conversation of space. There's again, for, it's not only theater, it's also art spaces that don't have their own space. You know, so, so really, and, and, and owning land is something that is, really, really important to garner wealth. So, you know, and so how do you do that in a way that acknowledges that this is indigenous land as well? And we also have to go beyond just land acknowledgement. It's like, okay, we're on indigenous land, but what else can we do to have indigenous folks own their own land? What can we do to maybe create trusts? You know, we have, I think we have to also think about the future, uh, even as theaters. And so for us, uh, having our own space has become very important. We're tired of being an itinerant theater, running from place to place, often getting treated really badly in those spaces, uh, often facing, uh, you know, even if not from the person who owns the space, but then from somebody who works in the space, uh, you know, getting getting treated like we uh, are guests constantly at every stage, uh, getting members of like, you know, our stage manager is African-American and then she gets treated horribly, you know, so just, just uh, things like that. And so, we are deeply involved in the question of getting our own space right now. And um, we're going to, we are in the process, we're going to do it on 27th and Lake, uh, and it'll take, probably take the next few years. But we're, we're, uh, so, so I feel like, like um, part, of, part of the solution is also to have, uh, to, to support and um, to figure out how we together as a theater ecology can support people if they want to, to own their own space. And how as a theater ecology, can we figure out how to support the theaters of color and artists of color that have never had the option? And, and now it's it's everybody, right? Even like, uh, you know, some of the artists, white artists that we worked with in um, the last play are doing postal work or doing other work. I mean, they, everybody has to hustle to survive at this moment. So it's like trying to figure out what that more equitable future will look like for all of us, really. And, uh, but at, and at the same time, to right the wrongs that have been done to people. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in all, all of these conversations and in a very real way. And how do we transform philanthropy as well? Like, no, not have, you know, not have foundation officers think like, you know, it's like such an imbalance of power in that relationship. So how do we kind of, and one of the things we've been working on in our conversation with fund, funders is how do we make that conversation be uh, uh, more equitable and more like, like uh, uh, partnership based, right? So, uh, and how do we change systems, even like systems of evaluation systems, the things that we are constantly forced to fill all the time, but how do we transform systems of evaluation to make sure that there's a more equitable kind of uh, partnership with foundations and with funders and so on. So I'm gonna stop there. And I would jump in and say, yeah, there, there was so much of value, it, like hundred percent to all of those things. And I think the it's the it's the organization's relationship with the artist that has to be rethought, mm -hmm. and also its space. So, like Nathan and Ansa have both graced the jungle stage in the past, and it feels like most theaters have sort of addressed that in, "I am buying some Nathan," and then Nathan's going to be on stage, and his purpose is to earn me some money. And now I finished with some Nathan, and I, now I'm going to buy me some Ansa. And then Ansa is going to earn me some money. And obviously, yes, I am selling tickets and I need to make money to keep my theater alive. But we're trying at the jungle, we're trying to rethink our relationship. So it's not just we are in a transition in a transitory passing way, availing ourselves of the artistic services of someone for as long as it's convenient and then moving them on. But how do you make a really mutually beneficial relationship? 
And how do you say you are coming to us and you bring things and we bring things? And how do we establish what it is we're trying to accomplish? And how do we move forward? So at the end of the day, I am better off, Nathan's better off, Ansa is better off, the audience is better off. It, it has to be a mutually beneficial thing though. And I think Nina's totally right that we are so privileged to have a space. There are days when, when the space needs a new roof, which is gonna cost $68,000 hypothetically, uh, that, <laughs> that I wish I didn't have a space. But that is a passing thing. And I know it is better most of the time to have it. And so we are developing a new program now. Christina Baldwin has been our interim artistic director and she has now been finalized as the real artistic director. And with her coming in, we are also bringing in a cohort of artists who will be on staff. And it will be a partnership where the artists will be part of helping us make decisions. So the choices we make, the ticket prices we set, the rehearsal schedules we set, the board decisions are driven in part by artistic input, not just me as managing director money person, but also so those artists get to use the building and they can use the stage to rehearse their own work. They can use the costume shop to build their own costumes. They can you know, use whatever things we have because we have a lot and it is incumbent on us to share the lot we have with everybody else because there is not enough to go around. And I don't know in after, with, when we come out of COVID, whatever that means, I, it will be interesting to see what the headcount is of people who've stayed in the business, the people who didn't get a day job and realized that it's actually kind of nice to work nine to five and then leave it at, leave it at the office or the freedom of doing Uber or, or just cannot go back to getting a couple hundred dollars stipend to do a show and work a gazillion hours. And so it is, if we have resources, now is the time for us to share those resources in the hope of getting as many people to stay in this ecosystem. Because the Twin Cities is blessed with an ecosystem of actors and directors and designers and technicians and stage managers and board members, and we can't afford to let that number dwindle. And Robin, on that note, I think you've all brought up such amazing points and um, thought-provoking concepts for us to think about. On that note, are there organizations that do that kind of work or will be looking at that and, and ways to support um, kind of a growing ecosystem or is it individual? Is it kind of based on individual organizations to take that on and theater organizations? I think at this point, it's kind of organization by organization. Every, every organization the day before the pandemic had its own mission and operating goals and priorities. And I think it's pretty safe to say that every organization now is rethinking, if, if not the guts of their mission, which probably hasn't changed, but very much how do you execute your mission, especially in light of COVID, in light of George Floyd, in light of everything else. So I think it's all still in the process of developing. And my guess is that, that everyone is approaching it in different ways. Mm -hmm. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, I'll just jump in real briefly. Uh, you know, places like the Playwright Center that uh, is a beacon in the country in terms of bringing creatives to literally just dedicate themselves to writing. That means they have access to what Gillette, uh, you know, Robin just said, like the, the actors, the directors, the designers. There's an ecosystem that's very unique to the Twin Cities. Uh, if you think about New York and commercial theater and what is happening for someone like Scott, Scott Rudin, for example, um, where we are we are actively making demands. And part of it is we are often just kind of, I love what you said a little bit, you're, you're hiring a little bit of Nathan for this thing. And the reality of it is you're hiring all of me, right? And so we have to create relationships and have some really intentional kind of understanding as to what does this contract mean for me? And not that it's a meritocracy. It doesn't mean that next year I'm guaranteed that thing, right? I'm opening the door for a future generation. And I think oftentimes we think of it like it's just transaction and on to the next show, but the reality of it, and you know, Nina's been in this game and Nathan's been in this game for a long time. They'll tell you, it's all about relationships. If you're an a-hole in the in rehearsal room, trust, you might not work next, next week because we talk, 
everyone in this community talks. It might be different in New York, might be different in, in Texas or wherever, whatever ecosystem you come from, but I think we have to also understand that we have something very unique here. It is about relationship. It is about being really intentional about how we create the art that we want to sustain the community, not the other way around, not the community has to sustain us, right? So our, our relationships with our theater is only gonna be as good as their relationship with our community. So I think that's really where it is. And quite frankly, where are the spaces where we can challenge ourselves, right? Like we have an awesome representation of Hmong people, of Somali people, of Liberians, of the list goes on and on, even Scandinavians for that matter, because not all white people are the same, right? <laughs> Whiteness is not, right? So let's really define what it is when we talk about culture, when we talk about the kind of work that we want to represent, language, right? The fact that, you know, I speak multiple languages, but I'll tell you 99% of the theater I do is only in English, mm. right? So it's not a criticism of there's a lack of, it's just me, oh, there's an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So part of it is also really having a mindset, like where are the opportunities? You know, she talked about the, Mina talked about the origins of Pangea, Nathan talked about Lecoq. We're all masters of our skills. Like this is by intention. It's not like we just woke up and said, this is a glass water theater. It might be, but I'm telling you, is there some very intelligent design behind it? And I think it's also about our worth in our industry. We have the opportunity to redefine what it means to be excellent and to be outstanding, right? And so let's do that. Yeah, it's yeah. lovely. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna add that I think the other element to this, and I, I don't know, exactly how it works, but the artists always have this conversation. We, we are having this conversation. We should continue to have this conversation and we will. Um, one thing that has stuck out to me in this time, and it's a tiny example, but talking to people who aren't, talking to people who are the audience, let's say, and they're saying, well, how are you? It must be so hard, which, right, it's absolutely, you can't do it. Like, you can't be creative. You can't, you can't do this and you go, yeah, but that's my, I'm an artist, like that's whatever, that's, that's me. How are you doing as an audience member not having it? Mm -hmm. Does it do, it doesn't do the same thing to you because you don't, it's not your living that you, you make of. But when it comes back, will you be, the audience has to be as much in this conversation and the diversity of the audience, our work in getting more, the representation in the audience is as important in this conversation so that we're not just operating as artists in our bubbles together, but that the, the audience is also needs it. Like it's like re, uh, recalibrating what the value of it is for them. And all these things I think do do that. I think this conversation does that. And that's why this, this is so great that people are here listening to it. But I, that's a major part of it is I think is how our audience comes back with us on it. Yeah, and something like the hope of this conversation was that and is that. And, you know, like, I think even as audience members, a lot of times we're theater patrons to perhaps like one theater or two. Um, so how can we also diversify the stages that we, that we experience and that we immerse ourselves in? So um, I think that's a really powerful point that you made. So I'd like to open it up at this point really for any questions or thoughts from the audience. <laughs> Perfect transition there. Um, yes, I will leave it with you. If, feel free to unmute yourself or add it in the comments, whatever you prefer. I just want to add one more thing though. Mm -hmm. I think I feel like um, part of how you do that is because because we've been doing this for 25 years and this is the work we do, right? Mm -hmm. So is is work with multiple communities. We've worked with uh, you know the the uh, Somali community, we've worked with Latinx communities. And I feel like part of what you do is to tell different stories, you know, and I you know, I agree with everything that you're saying, which is like how do you build deep relationality, not only with your actors, you know, how do you how do you build that relationality? How do you deliberately get people on your board that are totally uh, diverse and different? And uh, how do you and then also how do you uh, by, by telling stories, you get the audiences in that you want to get in seriously. And I, I, I feel like that's something that Pangea has done for the last 20 or whatever, how many ever odd years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, and it definitely showed me that um, the last stage that I 
experience was Pangea. So um, yeah. So any questions or um, thoughts from the audience? I don't have any questions at the moment, but uh, I'm just so glad that I could sit in and listen. It's been really fascinating. Um, I recently relocated from New York City where I was living for the last decade, trying to you know, make it as an actor and recently, you know, relocated and, you know, it's always kind of been on my um, mind to come utilize the Twin Cities market because this is where I'm from. And, you know, I hear about the amazing community and whatnot. And to move back during this time is like scary. It's not, it's a really crazy time to be um, joining it, but it's also really exciting to be hearing that it is such in a huge uh, reform and, you know, socially as well. It's, it's exciting. So, but very fascinating and uh, heartening to hear the shared experience. <laughs> Thanks so much, Derek, for joining and congrats on moving back. I think there's pandemic has seen an influx of migration from places and New York to Minneapolis is definitely one I've seen um, quite a bit. So, you know, to Derek's point, you're pointing to something that resonated with me because I was, a, I'm also a transplant. And I think uh, one thing that struck me here was, that, you know, Chicago, you do have a strong theater community and you have some TV. In LA, you have some amazingly TV and film. You know, New York kind of have it all in commercial theater. And I've always wondered why we don't have a pipeline because we have, you know, over 500 Fortune 500 companies that are headquartered here. Why do we not have similar kind of leverage in this market? Because all the actors that I look up to that are in film and TV all started in theater. Right. So what what is the uh, output that we can create in terms of the infrastructure where you can have film here, where you can have some crossover with TV? And, you know, thankfully, we have podcasts and Zoom, but I'm saying really intentionally some of the art forms that we know that we do best in terms of designers, actors and this, all the people that we've talked about would be if we had more kind of an infrastructure for us, to not just do theater, but also I'm gonna go for pilot season in St. Paul or in Minneapolis, and then I'm come back and I'm gonna do a show with Pangea, and then I'll go out the jungle, and then it's crossed with, you know what I mean? Like that's the kind of radical thinking I'm looking for. And I want to invite the business community in because we have multiple assets for them, right? When you talk to Fortune 500 companies, they'll tell you there's a pipeline problem. They can't hire enough diversity. Really, have you looked at the theater lately? Because we have everything. Right. And we do everything. So I think part of it is also there's this lack of understanding kind of the silo. We're not really crossing over. And, you know, to Mina's point about getting people on the board, they have part of their outcomes is dictated by what they're doing in the community. So there are spaces in theaters where they can join us. Right. And part of it is we have to make that really clear to the business community. We want your money, but we also want your people. We want access to your network. We want to build something. Right, and sometimes as artists, we're like, "Oh no, we no, say it." This is this is exactly what the vision looks like, and come join us and, and be part of that. And I think it's exciting, right? So I appreciate what you're saying, Derek. Thank you for sharing that. Wow, that's a really interconnected and quite, you know, like you said, disruptive vision. And I think that would benefit everyone. Like Robin said, like how can we benefit everyone involved and change a system? Um, that is a win-win-win. A, a um, that's kind of like the, the concept that I keep in mind. Um, so yeah, I, I re reckon that it's one o'clock. Um, thank you so much to the four panelists for joining. I think this conversation is something that's so compelling and um, hopefully leaves the audience with, with um, inspiration and um, excitement to get back to theaters, whether they're on the streets or outdoors. Um, please, you know, stay um, in the loop on everything that the four theaters are creating and the actors um, that we've showcased as well and follow them along in their journey um, and look forward to staying in touch. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.